violence, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so to thank you very much, John, and to your first question, um, should we scrap it or fix it? Of course we should fix it. Um, container deposit laws are the premier recycling laws of everything that, that I've experienced um, in my 30 years in recycling. Um, they are the best of the best, and it's because um, a properly designed container deposit program includes um, source separated collection so that we have the cleanest possible material that supports um, a circular economy. It can, the material can then be used in like into like. You can turn glass bottles into glass bottles again. It supports the use of refillables um, so that you can have even greater environmental benefit by re reusing the beverage containers over and over instead of just recycling them. You know, it's like an order of magnitude greater um, in terms of uh, greenhouse um, gas savings and energy savings and uh, uh, savings of toxics. But um, with a properly designed container deposit program, you can get recovery rates of 90% or, or more. Um, and you can do that just by properly designing the program and then flipping that on switch. And within a couple of years, you can get 80 or 90%. So they really are the best of the best. And then they also have this tremendous um, litter reducing feature. So um, that's, that's something that's sort of unique to beverage containers. They're, they're um, products that are used on the go and they're frequently littered and beverage container deposit laws um, incent people to either not litter them in the first place or if they do get littered, someone else will see them as money and will come along and pick them up. Um, they also, these programs also create jobs, um, 11 to 38 times as many jobs as landfilling of the same materials. They create economic development because when the material is collected and it's clean, for instance, um, over time, we've seen that PET collected through deposit programs um, is worth 40% more on average than PET through curbside programs. And right now the market is such that it's sort of double. Um, so the very same material, if it's collected in the right way can be worth more money. I mean, it just, it turns into economic development on the spot. Um, we also see of course that the recovery rates are so much higher with container deposit programs. And that's why container deposit programs are sort of on fire, um, you know, are growing like wildfire around the world. Back in at the beginning of 2017, we counted up all the container deposit programs around the world and we found that they served 300 million people. Well, since that time in that uh, four and a half, five year period, they have grown to now covering more than twice as many people. Um, so an extra, uh, extra container deposit laws came on board. I think 17 to 20 new programs came on board in the last four or five years. So they cover an additional 340 million people. Um, this has gone from you know, one, one or two states in Australia to now covering all seven states in Australia throughout Europe, country after country is adding a new container deposit laws all the way from um, Jamaica to the Seychelles, um, to Ireland, to the UK. Um, the, the idea is really, really popular. And why is it popular? A lot of it has to do with marine debris. Um, people are waking up to the horrors of how much plastic we have put in the ocean and how much plastic we are putting into the ocean um, every day. So the other part of your question, John, is what should we do to fix it? Um, I could go on and on about that for an hour. We have produced report after report and fact sheet after fact sheet, um, really going into each one of the kinds of problems that the California deposit law has. And we've dissected the problem. We've done these explainer fact sheets saying, here's, what's, here's the, the symptom, you know, redemption centers are closing. Why are they closing? Well, let's look at how they're compensated. Let's go through all of those numbers and really break it down so that everybody can understand that they're being undercompensated and so they're going out of business because um, they're going bankrupt and then here's how you fix it you can fix the compensation method um, it's gotten to a point where everybody in the state pretty much knows that everybody in recycling knows it knows that there are major problems with the financial reporting in the in the program as well 
the overall management of it, the way that um, supermarkets aren't enforced upon to make sure that they are collecting containers as they're required to do by law. Um, and I would say that in my opinion, SB 38 is the one, the one bill that's the closest in the direction of actually providing a comprehensive fix to the deposit law. But I know that there's a lot of issues with that where the, the you know, I'm sure we'll hear, we'll hear from folks on this call um, who have very specific problems with SB 38 and, and those are real. And um, that input is very much needed to come to a more comprehensive solution. But the other couple of bills that I see out there are little tiny band-aids. They're, they're bills that, that might bring us some more redemption centers, but um, like the pilot program that does five pilots, well, five pilot programs is not gonna replace 1300 redemption centers that went out of business. We've got vast areas of the state that are recycling deserts. And then we've got areas of the state where it's not quite a recycling desert, but it only has a few redemption centers. And those very few redemption centers are completely overwhelmed by the number of people that they're seeing. Um, so we need some, something big, we, a series of big things to fix this problem. And the last thing I'll say is, guess what? We have the money to do it. Um, the governor's budget that was released uh, is way off from, from what the, the real financial picture is. I um, requested and obtained the documents that Cal Recycle turns over to the state controller's office. And it turns out that the fund balance is $180 million larger than what was reported in the governor's budget. Um, so overall, the, the fund has about $500 million in it, at least. I don't have all the records yet because Cal Recycle still isn't um, finished preparing their uh, financials for last year. But there's the point is because of the closures and because of the pandemic, fewer containers were redeemed. Those unredeemed deposits are sitting in the fund. The money is there for a big fix, a series of big fixes. And that's what we need to do now. I will stop there. Thank you, John. Thank you, Susan. And it's a nice segue to, to Richard because the, the focus on the the buyback centers and needing to help them. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Richard Bay is with TriSed Community Recycling in, in uh, Fremont, Union City, and they operate a buyback center as well as the curbside collection program. And Richard is also a, a supervisor of the Alameda County Board of Supervisors. So he brings a political savvy to this discussion also. So Richard, fix it or scrap it. Yeah, uh, thank you, John, I appreciate that. Uh, I walked away from our budget session. I have to get back. So I'm just gonna do a short presentation and then get back to my colleagues about Alameda County's uh, budget for this coming fiscal year. Um, I agree with Susan, fix it. Uh, but uh, I am uh, at, at my end in terms of patience with regard to the legislative process. We know that it takes two to four years for legislation to be created. And then as Susan said, it's usually piecemeal and not thorough. Uh, when I see uh, homeless people pushing shopping carts on bicycles, walking in with sleeping bags and redeeming about five to $7 per visit at Triset every day that we're open. Today we had uh, a little over 300 customers, 8,000 pounds of one-time use PET plastic soda bottles and water bottles were redeemed. Uh, 4,000 pounds of aluminum cans were redeemed. Nearly 10,000 pounds of glass containers were redeemed in one day. A lot of our customers are living on the edge and they're waiting in line for an hour and a half in cars to redeem the recyclables. So I have been in discussion with the Alameda County District Attorney's Office to bring a consumer action, environmental law um, action against the state for not enforcing the California Redemption Value Law. The consumers have been um, on the short end of the stick. The state is holding their money. The Environmental Protection uh, Cal, Cal EPA's mission statement is, I just took a little bit of it, 
uh, it basically to, let me read your Cal EPA's mission. I'm reading the second paragraph. We fulfill our mission by developing, implementing, and enforcing environmental laws that regulate air, water, and soil quality, pesticide use, and waste recycling and reduction, which they're not doing. So I've asked the Alameda County District Attorney's Office Consumer Protection and Environmental Protection Task Force to look at representing the counties. There are at least three or maybe four north of us who have absolutely no redemption centers in our counties, but they don't have a district attorney's office that has consumer and environmental protection departments that can wage a fight to enforce this law. She, uh, her name is Nancy O'Malley. She's known for her expertise and for her tenacity and her task force is looking at the law and looking about bringing a, an action. Uh, and I asked her to do that because again, I'm fed up with the fact that people are struggling. The state isn't moving. And we've been talking about this for three to five years. And Cal Recycle gives us the same song, which is fine. I understand that they can't do anything unless the legislature says it. And then the legislature puts up piecemeal uh, initiatives uh, but they have to put up with the uh, people who are lobbying them on different sides and different fronts. And so at the end of the day, um, four tons of one-time used plastic bottles has to end. There are alternatives. An aluminum can can be used uh, 20 times over and over. And you can put water in it and you can put soda in it. And you can use it 20 times. And it's far more lucrative than plastic soda bottles, which can only be used once. We have a pile that's huge at Tricet, a beautiful plastic soda bottles, water bottles, one-time use. They look beautiful, but they're only being used once. And that pile never stops growing. And the, the redemption value for that is a nickel or a dime but the scrap value for that is now running about eight cents a pound versus aluminum, which is currently at around 44 cents a pound. It's absurd, it doesn't make sense. And I'm hoping that the district attorney will go after the stores uh, who are discouraging people from coming to their stores by paying a fine to the state, which keeps people away from their stores. So the intent of the law has been lost. And what we uh, all worked for back when AB 2020 passed, way back when, uh, has been lost. But other states are doing it. And as Susan can tell you, they're doing it the right way. They're raising deposits, increasing the visibility of redemption centers, increasing opportunities for people to get those nickels and dimes back. So it's time for some action. I hope to come back with uh, a request to NICRA to sign on to an editorial if we can get the district attorney's office to move this action. And I hope we can count in your support. Thank you. Well, thank you, Richard. And I'll, we'll let you get back to your very interesting budget meeting, I'm sure. But I, I am a lawyer and I, and I have looked myself at, you know, ways to get Cal Recycle or the, or the state to enforce the bottle bill, like in the matter you said. So if you wouldn't mind plugging me into that with the, with the district attorney, I'd be Happy to share my thoughts on that too. Thank you. So segueing from, from what Richard said um, about the what it's like to be at a redemption center and, and Susan's point that we need to we need to bolster them. I've asked Adolfo Ramirez to speak to us. Um, his father's company is BC Recycling. They're, they're located in Visalia in the Central Valley. They have several satellite buyback centers and one main redemption center where they have machinery and equipment. And I represent them. And I'll tell you that even though Cal Recycle says they can't do anything to help, they have found hundreds of man hours to persecute BC Recycling in a way they would never do to grocery stores and never do to franchise haulers. So I've asked him to share some thoughts about what could be done to help you know, his redemption center so Adolfo, take it away. Good evening, everybody. Hey, John, thanks for having me. Um, 
just a little background. Uh, my father started his business in 1994. Uh, when he started business, he had been a, a buyback operator for a few years, so he already had some experience. Um, during his time in business, we have seen up and downs. Uh, you know, the commodity prices affect our business, you know, directly. So during the last great recession, we were cutting it close. But uh, besides that, during these past, you know, almost 30 years, we have been able to stay afloat. And, um, you know, we have been successful. Um, I do think that with some enhancements, the program can work. Um, currently, I think that uh, the biggest issues we're facing is um, like the local government cities, they're they're very reluctant for new uh, buyback centers to open, to find more convenience for the customers to come in and redeem their cans, the plastic. So, um, you, you know, that's one of our issues is that we can't get certifications. Here in Visalia, um, the city won't allow any new centers unless they're, you know, at the grocery store and sometimes they don't have the space for it. But, you know, I think, uh, local government has been a little bit hesitant too because um, they kind of attribute the homeless issue to us. You know, we have a lot of um, homeless customers that, you know, they rely upon us to get their, you know, their money for their food, for, you know, whatever they may need. So the cities kind of look at us and they frown upon us because they think that we're pushing that. Uh, and, you know, we actually, you know, our recycling center here, uh, you know, we see customers, you know, drive up in brand new cars. We see homeless people that need the money, but uh, mainly we have seen that the people that come in to redeem are people that are in need and they need to uh, get their money for the groceries, for, for their gas. So we, uh, we are providing a good service for the, for the people, for the residents here of the city. Um, another issue that we're facing is, uh, you know, the high cost, you know, wages have been going up, uh, insurance rates are going up and, uh, an issue that we would, we would have with SB 38 is that we would have a lot of volume maybe be dispersed where now we rely upon good volume, you know, to turn around profits and be able to pay our employees our costs. So, um, you know, that, that's the issue I see there. And also, um, you know, we as a recycling facility, we're equipped to handle um, the recycling waste. We're probably better equipped than the grocery stores. I mean, I think it would be a, a little bit of a of an issue for them to be handling, you know, like the recycling waste. You know, I, I can see their reluctance to receive the containers because, you know, not all the time do they come in, you know, washed and clean. And here we're prepared to to handle those situations. And, uh, you know, with a little bit more support, I think, from from Cal Recycle, where we can see certification times, you know, come around faster so we can you know, try to open more buybacks and uh, with support from the city, I think that would help us a lot too. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that if there was more support for facilities, facilities like ours where we can handle uh, not only cans, plastic, but we can take cardboard, we can take e-waste and, uh, you know, we have the equipment to handle a lot more things. And I think that if we had a little bit more support as well, we can take a lot of stress off of the smaller uh, recycling centers that are found at grocery stores. And, you know, we run both, so we know the ins and outs of it. And, um, you know, it, we've been doing it for almost 30 years, uh, since 1994. So, you know, we, we, we know how it's done. Well, if you could tell the legislature what to do to help you, what would you say? I think, um, you know, if we could have uh, faster certification times, uh, a bit less regulations uh, so that, you know, our businesses can come out and invest money into the program. And, uh, you know, in general, feel more support from, from not only local government, but maybe, maybe Cal Recycle as well, feel like we're supported. That way we can, uh, you know, we, we've been doing a job for a long time and, and you know, we, we're still here. So we just need a little bit more support from our government and, and hopefully, you know, we can last a few more years or a lot more years. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Adolfo. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. You're so a next hero, I'm gonna... Adolfo. You're a hero. Keep on, keep on keeping on, buddy. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so to segue now to Dan Knapp, 
Uh, we've had Richard Vai and Adolfo Ramirez both talk about the interaction with, with the customers at the Redemption Center. We've heard Susan talk about that the Redemption Centers need more support. Dan's going to bring a little bit of a different perspective because amongst us, he's the only PhD in sociology on the call. And I think he, he's going to talk about the, the sociology of resource recovery, and I wanted him to share that perspective. Dan? Well, um, I thought that Susan was going to go first and read from my uh, interview. Is that not happening? It's happening after. OK. You're so doing I your. Want you to start. I want you to talk about sociology and recycling first. OK. Well, um, tell you the truth, I didn't get into sociology right away in college. I was in Asian studies, believe it or not, until I got my master's degree. And I never took a single course, sociology course before I entered the PhD program at the University of Oregon. But I did real well there. Uh, I brought a lot of my Asian studies background with me into it and um, ended up uh, writing my doctoral dissertation on the war on poverty, actually, and on a little known but very important organization that was uh, uh, brought in to uh, kind of scout the war on poverty. I wrote my, my dissertation is called Scouting the War on Poverty. Mary Lou doesn't like the title very much, but that's basically what it's about. It was 18 different de uh, what they call demonstration projects that happened in mostly in cities. And one was in Lane County, Oregon, which is where uh, University of Oregon is. So my thesis advisor was an entrepreneurial sociologist. He went out and got grants. He needed a writer. Uh, he needed somebody to do his reports. Uh, he needed somebody to write um, proposals, and that was me. So he put me into an office, and I ended up going back to Washington, D.C. when You just froze. Dan, can you hear me? Any boxes of signed memos, many from Robert Kennedy and others that I turned over to the Kennedy Library at some point after I finished my dissertation. Um, I did that for a while. I taught uh, sociology. I kind of morphed my sociology into kind of forward looking things. I started uh, toward the end. I, I ran a course with a Marxian uh, sociologist or actually political scientist. Bob Seip, and we called it uh, 20th century homesteading. It was all about back to the land. It was about appropriate technology, which I had always been interested in. And uh, we ran that course for a little while, but I decided I didn't want to be in the university anymore, so I got out. Next thing I did was I needed, after about two years, I needed to make some money. So I went to work for the county as head of the Office of Appropriate Technology. It was one of two that was um, uh, ever set up and um, in, in a county government. And we ran headlong into the solid waste management establishment, which did not want us to be there. They definitely didn't like us. They didn't want us around. They couldn't actually say that. It was not considered the best thing to do to uh, you know bully us or anything like that, but that's what happened. So after a year, I gave that up, hitchhiked down to Berkeley looking for a way to do what I was trying to do there, but they wouldn't let us do, they wouldn't let us touch anything. We could study all we wanted and they didn't like that either. But um, once we turned in the reports, nothing would happen. So I came down to Berkeley, uh, four days later, I'm working at the landfill as a scavenger. That's where I really started applying my sociology to the real world, because here we were at a 400 ton per day landfill with more stuff coming at us every day than we could ever possibly deal with. Um, and we were trying, but we were uh, you know, only able to pay ourselves four bucks an hour because we didn't know what we were doing yet very well. And we didn't have any buildings and we didn't have any way of getting our stuff to the scrap dealers. So I would hire uh, customers to haul our stuff to the scrap dealers. That's and, and believe me, when you're doing that, you're, you're constantly telling people how 
the business works and how your what your vision is for the business. You're doing this environmental education job that Richard Valley talked about so eloquently a few minutes ago. You're doing it as people that used to man those CRV redemption centers always did when people come in. You're telling people how to prepare their loads, how the business works, how the finances work. How, you know, you're answering all these questions and all of that is applied sociology. And it's all very, very, uh, it all traces right back to my uh, academic training because fundamentally where I, where, you know, the mentor that I chose when I had to actually teach sociology was C. Wright Mills. He was a guy that was a very interesting fellow. He now has a whole school of sociology around him. He died very young. He was only 45 years old when he died. He had four heart attacks before that. He used to ride around on motorcycles. He was quite a character. And he was a very combative sort of guy. Uh, some people see me as combative too, and I am to a degree, and so is Mary Lou. Uh, sometimes we call her the uh, victorious battle maiden <laughs> because she, she doesn't take a whole lot of shit from anybody. So. Um, Anyway, that's sociology for you. I, I wrote something and I sent it to everybody that might have gotten your invitation. I hope you have a chance to read it. In it are some real interesting uh, excerpts from interviews, one with John Holes, another with um, um, Delin Keyes. I was thinking I would read those, but um, I might have run out, out of time. You can tell me, John. Well, what I was, I was, I know you and I have talked about the idea of promoting um, reverse vending machines as a way to help gain redemption. And I know that you you have some, you know, ill feelings about that. And I was hoping you would share those. Okay, well, I, I will. Uh, a, a reverse vending machine is just a, a big chunk of metal that sits there. You can stick it into a, um, you know, a supermarket place and sure they have their place, but they don't replace human beings. They don't, you know, you can put all the labels on these things and on your bins that you want, and you can put out leaflet after leaflet after leaflet, but nothing really takes the place of a human being walking up and saying, uh, hey, what's in your load? Uh, let's see, oh, this is recyclable, but this isn't. Oh, this, uh, here's why we can take this and here's why we can't take that. All those kinds of explanations go on all the time when you have humans in the picture. And that is what we need. Uh, and so I see the whole, uh, the whole approach that organizations like the EPR organizations are pushing as automation versus labor. And I'm thinking that labor is really the key. And we've heard that from Susan, we've heard that from from uh, Richard, both. They talk about the people who actually go out there and find all those containers that have deposit value and bring them in. Those are human beings, they're not machines. Machines don't do that kind of stuff and they won't and they can't. So we need all of those things, but automation has its place. Um, some automation is always good, urban or is not nothing you know we don't have an ideological framework that says never use machinery that's not the way we are we use machinery all the time we use computers we do all sorts of but it's appropriate use of those things it's not just slavish devotion to machinery uber alles it's not that that's not what we're about in this field so you know Recycling is just full of sociological insights when you do it right. And when you do it right, you get clean materials, which is what Susan would like to see happening. Susan uh, <laughs> Collins would like to see happening. She's right, totally right. Um, and that's what we need. Can I tell a small anecdote? Do. <laughs> okay. Can I have my time? No, no, one, would, no one would tell you no. <laughs> you better. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Well, when I first met Dan, I was, a, I was a bureaucrat. I was working for the state of California. He came to my agency to speak and I was put in control of him purportedly. Uh, and I, I was his project manager. He was gonna write a thick piece for my agency. And so I asked him um, in, as, just as part of working with him, I said, what, what are you doing in this field anyway? The, 
the whole field of recycling is full of engineers and you're a sociologist, what are you doing? And he said, well, the engineers agree that we have enough machinery and what we need to do is change people's behavior. And that's what sociologists do. So that's why I call urban or a sociology experiment that worked. And it, and it also underscores what he just said, that what we need is people. We need to change people's behavior. And that's the way we're going to return more resources into the supply chain. So I just wanted to throw that out. And, and also another thing that Dan very often points out is in terms of labor versus capital, we sure do have a lot of excess labor. And recycling is a very good way to employ people. So why not do that? Max Wexler, um, I asked Max Wexler, who's now in charge of not only the operation of Urban Ore, but also re, uh, one part of it, a very important part, uh, the general store receiving part. And I said, Max, how many, please estimate for me, how many times a day you do environmental education in the course of handling people's loads? And he thought for a while, I think it took him two or three days to come up with a number. And he said, finally, he said, about 40. 40 times a day, Max Wexler is telling people uh, something that amounts to environmental education. You don't get that from machinery. You can't. Maybe Max would like to speak about that. Max? Sure. It took me a few days because I had to figure out what environmental education meant once I figured out that included just a brief explanation of why we can't accept something or can or what the options are. Mary Lou, maybe you overheard a phone call in the office today. Someone called, said they had 60, um, I picked up the phone. Hi, I have 60 uh, spray paint cans. Um, can you buy them from me? <laughs> so no, um, actually we can't um, even accept those because if they don't sell, we have to pay extra as a business to dispose of them as household hazardous waste. Um, although like, you know, theoretically, if we did accept them and sold them for reuse, they wouldn't qualify as waste and therefore not hazardous waste, but there's so much nuance to it, but basically my answer was no. Um, and then, you know, it's a 30 second conversation. I, you know, I, I forgot about it, honestly. Like, I don't remember all these interactions. And so when, Dan, you asked me that question, I had to think throughout the day, how many times are customers asking, you know, what to do with the stuff? And we have to explain to them um, the options and, and the why, you know, and, and it, sometimes it changes, you know, depending on a variety of factors. So I, I came up with 40, but, you know, take it with some salt. But it also comes to what, what, what you spend money on. You know, if yeah. you spend money on people sitting at a computer and writing uh, labels and, and, um, and brochures urging people to recycle, that's one thing. And sure, it's important, but you also ought to have that labor actually handling the materials because the material, because you know, this stuff is heavy. It has to be handled. It has to go somewhere really fast. It comes in, you're, gonna, you're not going to just leave it by the side of the road. It's got to go somewhere. And so you have to have people that are motivated and you have to have a, a, a financial structure that allows you to pay them a living wage and actually better than a living wage because you get better uh, service that way. So, you know, it's, it's all about applied sociology is what we're doing. And I just hope that everybody here understands that that is the business we're in, really. You know, don't, don't think of sociology as something that goes on in the university behind closed doors when the professor is talking to the students. That's one kind of sociology. But another kind is out there in the real world actually making things happen and explaining how it happens and, and, uh, and having a vision of how it could happen and moving toward that vision. And, that's what people like Nicholas Harvey are doing. That's what people are, are doing uh, um, who run these CRV centers. Um, Adolfo, you're one of those people. Um, I have great admiration for you. 
and your father for staying in business this long. Uh, we've been at it 40 years ourselves. It's a kind of a miracle sometimes. I know you must feel the same way. Um, and probably have lots of stories about when it was really tough and you still manage to come to work every day and work 10 hour days if you have to or 12 or 14 or whatever it takes. And change people's thank, behavior. Thanks, Dan. Thank, thank you also, Susan and Adolfo. Um, we're gonna op open it up to questions. And because I'm the moderator, I get to ask the question first. Well, wait, wait, um, wait. Susan. What happened to Susan Kinsella? I'm sorry. What happened to Susan Kinsella? She, she's still here. We're going to do okay. the, we're going to do the recycling okay. archive shortly. Never mind. I don't so want to. We're going to do a question. Just a minute. So Susan Collins, I'm going to ask you an an unprepared question. You've talked about I know the surplus the Cal Recycle has, the difference between what the distributors have paid in and what gets paid out in redemption because it's hard to get redemption nowadays. So Cal Recycle's got a bunch of money. In the past, the governor's tried to siphon that money off. That's probably not a good thing. Cal Recycle says it can't pay that money to the redemption centers without the legislative authority, which by the way, there's no pending bill to do that this year. So I'm wondering this, what if the legislature suspended the obligation of consumers to pay deposits on, on containers at all until that surplus gets down to zero yeah. as a way to bring some attention to this problem and spur the legislature to do something more meaningful. Sorry to spring that on you. Yeah, well, it's interesting because what's, um, first of all, I, I, I'm sort of going through my mind of how long that could actually happen. And it can only happen for about two months um, before it would eat through that money because the, the fund goes through about $1.3 billion a year, you know, about a hundred million a month. So you wouldn't want to do that for too long, but you know, I'm entertaining your idea. Um, I do right. in my head. Um, but I think it, it's still, it, it's interesting and doesn't get around the issue of, um, the way people are treated differently in different parts of the state, just based on where they live, the, the deep unfairness of it, how deeply unfair it is that some people live in an area where they can redeem, which is mainly at a redemption center. Sometimes it's at a, a store that's a willing participant, but there, there are just these huge areas. And, and I live near one of them. I live in Culver City, California, which is like in between, you know, Inglewood, Beverly Hills, and Santa Monica and Venice. I'm in the middle of all that. Uh, everybody west of the 405 doesn't have access to a redemption center all the way up to Malibu, you know, going up, you know, 20, 30 miles up the coast. Um, there's there's no okay. place for people to go to the redemption center. So it's just, I mean, it, it wouldn't fix the problem of the deep unfairness of it, that some people can easily get their redemption back and others can't. Thanks. Does anybody have questions for any of our speakers? Yes. Nick? I have. Yeah. Um, so, oh, do yeah, I go? go ahead, Nick. No. No, I'll, I'll get in line. I'm good. So, what's really interesting that Dan had noted is um, I found I was talking, I don't know if it was recorded before this, uh, the meeting started at 5 30. When I was talking about the client, about the five foot diameter redwood tree, she first reached out to us trying to sell us the tree. And of course I had to explain to her, that's not what we do, but she really wanted to see the tree repurpose. You know, what's ironic is that in our business, people come to us because they see immediate value because they know that wood is expensive. So how is it perhaps that we can help people understand that this plastic one costs money in terms of the raw material commodities and ultimately how it's coming out of the ground and two also can create money perhaps not as much as timber right but um i have to actually go through that entire education process and it's not so easy for me to just hand this knowledge over to someone else or even necessarily make a flow chart right the photo i showed earlier was a tree that was in someone's front yard great side access you take it down in large chunks now I have uh, the Starbucks next to our luxury retail showroom. So it's a Starbucks reserve, the fancy Starbucks. 
And uh, that general manager wants to have our furniture, but you know, they can't because, you know, Starbucks, large corporation, et cetera, et cetera. He can't make decisions, but he had trees that he wanted to see repurposed. Except his trees are wedged in the back of a backyard next to a swimming pool. And there's no really easy way to repurpose them. So you have this sort of thing where uh, the value changes depending on, you know, what is the, the access. But uh, it just reminded me about how I have to educate people daily. And what Dan had talked about is it's a very personal sort of thing. And I'm not the first person to be doing what I'm doing, right? There's other people, but they try and go after, you know, they try and cut down the tree, they try and mill the tree, they try and cure it, they want to fabricate into furniture. They try and do all these different things. Whereas I focus on taking vault, like the material in and I focus on moving it out, but there's this black box where I have all these other subcontractors and owner operators I'm able to work with uh, who can perform the actions we need. So I don't know if that added insight, but uh, what Dan was saying, I see and even what we do. Well, yeah, we do the same thing. We have all sorts of contractors and uh, businesses that depend on us. And, and you know, during COVID here, when we had to close down, when they did this uh, shelter in place order, what we did for those three days when we were closed was we looked at the guidance from the state and they said, uh, if you're an essential business, we want you to stay open. Well, we, we thought, well, geez, we better find out what an essential business is. We're essential because Working. Not hearing you, Dan. Uh, Boone, thank you. Mary Lou, did you have a bottle bill question? I do. Um, I I'm wondering know. whether um, one of the things that Susan said that uh, struck a uh, chord with me, uh, Dan actually, a couple of years ago, Dan asked Doug Brooms to do some surveys of uh, deposit centers, uh, deposit refund centers around um, in the East Bay. And I, I don't know, what were there, seven or eight, something like that? No, there were only about three or four that Doug ever got, but uh, he three did a four. really great job. But a really good job. And one of the points that came out in the interviews that Doug did with the operators of those uh, businesses is that the people who, just as Susan said, the people who come to get the, the nickels, um, those are those are low income people. Well, Susan and, um, I'm sorry, the Adolfo? Yeah, Adolfo. Adolfo, mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. Said is uh, the people who come get the you're, you're muted again. You're, you're, you're frozen, Mary Lou. Homeless assistance funds. Anybody? Could they be called their their bottle redemption their refunds um, deposit refunds, but they they go to homeless people. Can't they be included in like homeless financing programs? Uh, I think we might be uh, having problems. Are we still on? We're, I think we missed your question, Mary Lou. Yeah, it's cutting in and out. Oh, sorry. Okay, so is there a way to define bottle deposit? No. Yep, lost you again. Sorry. Liz, did you have a question? I do. I do. Hey, Mary Lou, I was going to say maybe you can type your question in the chat since we couldn't quite quite hear it audio audio style. Um, my question is to Susan. Susan, what is the what is the big, huge, or maybe there's a couple of big, huge barriers, and they may be industry barriers, but I'm not even sure what industry into getting the darn bottle bill fixed, because I see it come up session after set in some way, shape, or form, and so there's some kind of pushback. But I, for the life of me, I, I don't really know. Maybe you can explain it a little simply, like who's fighting. Fighting the fixes. Yeah, the the number one. Um, we we had a moment in time 
where things could have been fixed if the legislator had actually listened to the people who were saying we were in, in an impending crisis and if they had believed us. Um, back in 2016 was when we wrote the report explaining um, how the redemption centers were being underpaid and we predicted that they would close. And each year I could use the, the data from CalRecycle and I think it was the beginning of 2019, I said, it looks like 400 redemption centers are gonna close this year. And it's not because I have a crystal ball, it's because I have a calculator. And I can see from the data that CalRecycle produces, I can see how many of the redemption centers are being underpaid as a result of the payment formula. It, it shows up really clearly on, on a graph. And, um, and the legislature, um, it, it, they didn't just do it alone. I mean, the legislature was, was fed misinformation from some folks who really wanted those redemption centers to close. And there were, there were bills that were put forward that would have paid the redemption centers more money, but they also had poison pills in there that would have forced a bunch of the redemption centers to close. That happened a few times. So there were, there were some folks uh, putting some things in the bills that weren't helpful at all, which made it so that even the redemption centers that would have been paid more money couldn't support those bills because they would have put a bunch of the redemption centers out of business. The other thing that has happened repeatedly with this program is that the redemption centers generally have no voice. They're not represented in the legislature in the way that all of the other stakeholders in the program are. There isn't you know, one lobby that just represents, or one lobbyist that just represents redemption centers. And even if there was, they'd be completely outnumbered by the number of lobbyists that represent other stakeholders like um, beverage manufacturers and um, waste haulers. So there was a moment in time when this all could have been caught and fixed after we'd only seen a few hundred redemption centers close. But now we're dealing with a completely different situation. Now we've got to put all the pieces back together again. Now we've seen 1300 redemption centers closed around the state. And there aren't that many companies that think it's a good idea to come in. Like, you know, they've been fooled too many times and they don't trust the state of California. The biggest operators in the business that could come into the state have, to, you know, that operate in different states um, and different, even different countries. Um, ones that have a proven track record of, of being able to operate deposit programs have directly said to me, I, there's no way I'm going to do business in California that it, because they've seen the capriciousness of the, the way that the payment formulas have changed and just pulled the rug out from under people. So um, at, we're at the point now where everything needs to change. And um, when it comes to the operation of the program, I can name four or five issues that are, that are hundred million dollar a year issues um, that need to be fixed. So it's not just like little fixes, it's huge fixes that are needed. Well, well let me follow up Liz's question, Susan, then, because you said at the outset that the, the redemption centers need help and you said it again. So the question is who's blocking them? What stakeholders are saying, we don't want those redemption centers to get any more money. We want them to go out of business. Who's saying that? Uh, pretty much everybody who isn't a redemption center, probably. <laughs> I mean, there, there, really? there are plenty of disinterested parties as well. But, um, but even CalRecycle commissioned a report and spent a million dollars on it and asked and had UC Berkeley work on a report and even though this isn't absolutely stated overtly in the report, it is clear that what Berkeley was asked to model, and they were asked to put together an economic model, what they were asked to model is what, what would happen if one third of the convenience zone redemption centers went out of business, what would happen if two thirds of the convenience zone redemption centers went out of business, and what would happen if all of the convenience zone centers went out of business. So all of that study was looking at what would happen if there were more and more and more closures, like sort of how many closures could we withstand and still have a system in the state that consumers considered convenient. So there wasn't a bit of the report that said, how can we improve the system, provide more convenience, 
How do we look for the places in the state that don't have enough convenience? How do we go to our consumers and say, is this system making you happy? Is there something we can do to make this an even better system? Is there something we can do to give you a better consumer experience? How can we get you to recycle more? None of those questions were asked by that report. It was all looking at ways to shut down this portion of the system, that portion of the system, and even more. Sounds to me like there's a prime mover behind this somewhere. Does anybody else have any questions of Susan, Adolfo, or Dan on the bottle bill? John, John, got a quick one. Quick question, John. For me? Yes. Go ahead, David. Um, for Susan, you had mentioned SB 38 as being a good bottle bill fix. Um, NICRA belongs to a lobbying group, the Clean Seas Coalition, and the, the coalition backed AB 1454 instead. And I was wondering if you had kind of a comparison of the two bills and, and why the SB 38, in your opinion, is better. I do and I don't. And that's because I haven't read the latest version of SB 38 all the way through. If, if anybody's tried to read that, they know what I mean. It's a really, really long bill. Um, but I know that it, it attempts to make a more comp, I like the direction it's going in because it's trying to make a more comprehensive change and it's attempting to provide universal um, access to redemption so that everybody has it. Way, way, way more redemption points. Um, so for consumer fairness, I like it a lot better. Um, I did just review uh, 1454 and I found it to be a very weak bill. I found it to not do much of anything. Um, there are some more payments to redemption centers, which is always gonna be a good thing. Um, but then it goes back to the idea of um, the same poison pill thing that I've talked about that has been introduced in the bills year after year after year. In this case, what the poison pill looks like is that it says the, this convenient zone structure that we have now that's not working because it's not being properly enforced, we're gonna throw that out and put in random convenience zone structure that is of Cal Recycles choosing. And I've got to think that's going to be fewer convenience zones and fewer redemption centers and um, will probably result in existing redemption centers that are receiving handling fees becoming ineligible to receive handling fees because they will be redefined out of existence. And that, again, that's the poison pill that would cause redemption centers to close and would cause um, worst access for consumers. It's the same mechanism that we've seen year after year after year introduced in these bills. And that's why I personally, you know, NYCRI has opposed them. We need more access for consumers, not less access for consumers. Mary Lou, you have a question? Yes, let's see if... Uh you will pick it up. Um, my real question is, does CalRecycle want to grow this program? It's easy to design things to fail if you don't want them to work. Susan? Um, I would say that I have seen insufficient enforcement of the program on multiple levels. I have brought it to the attention and written an entire report about the way that the beverage manufacturers are not turning over all of the deposits initiated, that there's about $200 million a year um, that doesn't get paid into the fund. And that report was written in 2014. So that was seven years ago now. So multiply $200 million times seven years. That's the money that hasn't been paid into the fund as it was supposed to be. So that's step one. <laughs> that's when the deposit gets initiated. Then we just go level after level after level through the program. And at every stage, there's insufficient enforcement. So the thing just isn't functioning like it's supposed to be. If we had a normal level of enforcement with the, um, the grocery stores, everybody would have access to redemption at their local grocery store. This, this recycling desert thing wouldn't even exist. 
And I could go on and on and on about that. So there have been multiple failures of enforcement and that's nobody's job at CalRecycle. So as a, as a follow-up question, I'm on the board of directors of a British, I'm the only um, person from the US of A who's on the board of directors of a British Columbia bottle depot. Mary Lou, we can't hear you. We still can't hear you. Portia, did you have a question while we get Mary Lou back online? No. No, I was just applauding um, what Susan said. <clears throat> Thank you, Portia. Yeah. Hello, everybody. It, it, Okay, it sounded to me like the answer to Mary Lou's question was no, CalRecycle wants it to fail. Yes. We, we can never get in the mind of somebody else. I can, I can only state the facts and the patterns that I see. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, goody. Because uh, I'm on the board of directors of a British Columbia oh. Depot Operators Association and they have EPR up there, Extended Producer Responsibility. And the uh, producers, producer, by the way, does not equal manufacturer. There's a whole, it's so complex and very, right. very confusing. And very few people can actually accurately describe the entire system. And I think that was by design. And I'm wondering whether there, I know that there's EPR activism going on in California. Uh, California Product Stewardship Council is very, very active. And the former head of that uh, organization, Heidi Sanborn, who now uh, is head of a, or works with a uh, national lobbying organization for EPR. One of the things she said to a NICRA recycling update some years ago is, well, we need a lot more EPR. And if we have more EPR, we're gonna need a lot more lobbyists. So I'm wondering whether the very powerful forces of EPR are helping CalRecycle basically deep six its own operation. Is there any way to know anything at all about that? There's, I, 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 can, I can know a lot of things that where I can read facts and statistics and financial statements and reports. Um, but as to whatever motivations and conversations are going on behind closed doors, we can only speculate and I don't love to do that. Yeah. But, but what you do great, Susan, and one of the reasons I asked you to join this is because you're the most data driven person in this field that I know. You always have the numbers handy, which, you know, is just completely something I could never do. But well, thank, thank you. you. I bet you're about to stump me right now, right? No. <laughs> Just trying to thank you. Oh, thank you, John. Anybody else have any questions before we move on to the recycling archives? Well, then let's move on to the recycling archives. And after we do the recycling archives segment, we are gonna have Doug talk about the current bottle bills. I think there's four of them. And we'll talk about those and some of the pros and cons, including SB 38. And so, Susan is the director of the Recycling Archives, and she is going to do some readings about Dr. Dan Knapp. And so I will turn it over to you, Susan. Cool, thank you. Um, let me make, so you can hear me okay, right? Yes. Okay, good. Sometimes I'm having trouble too. Um, well, what I wanna do is read some passages from Dan, Knapp, Dan Knapp's um, Recycling Archives interview. They give you some idea of the paths that he's traveled to get to the point that he's at now. I mean, today we know him as a very successful reuse business that he's built, as well as for his incisive and vis visionary wisdom that he's known for internationally about how to build a more successful entrepreneurial and community-based recycling system. But he certainly didn't start out that way. In fact, you know, I think his story is a good illustration of John Lennon's comment about how life is what happens when you think you're planning other things. So these are some readings that I put together from Dan's interview when he had just gotten his PhD in sociology. And in his interview, he's just been asked, when did you first become aware of recycling as a distinct idea? So this is what he says. 
Likely it was in a six month period when I was getting ready to teach the first class I ever taught solo at the college level in the spring of 1970. I had just become an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Oregon. I chose the environmental handbook as a text because it had lots of short, brilliantly written essays and punchy broadsides from all sorts of environmental scientists and activists. This book was profoundly influential. For millions, it was the initial call to action for what became the first Earth Day. And its editor was Garrett DeBell. Garrett wasn't a recycler, but he was the author of a very short piece on recycling, the only one in the whole book. And he put out a quietly revolutionary message that I've returned to again and again. Garrett said we should mimic natural systems. In natural systems, everything gets recycled. Everything cycles and there is no waste. I don't know that I heard the word recycling anytime earlier than that. He goes on to say, teach-ins sprouted on campuses all over during the 1960s. Both students and faculty organized teach-ins. These events went far beyond and often far above protests to analysis and group problem solving. That positive approach made sense to me. Teach-ins appealed because they were nonviolent and hopeful. Students became teachers. They became empowering themselves to think and act on their beliefs and to become responsible citizens. The environmental teach-in of 1970 that kicked off on April 22nd changed the look and the feel of campuses all over the USA. It was not business as usual. Classes went outside, the weather was good, the sun came out, students debated issues on the campus lawns. I had studied social movements, so watching all this unfold was a primer on converting theory into action. And then a few months later, I hired into a brand new school, Sangamon State University, which is now called the University of Illinois at Springfield. And I taught there for six years after two at Oregon. In Illinois, I used to go out into the fields with portable electronic media and record sights and sounds of the harvest. I was startled to see how much fossil fuel was used in that type of farming. The farmers used propane gas to dry the grain before it went into storage. There were big flames, lots of noise. The old time farmers looked defeated, faces deeply lined, beaten down by market forces they could not control. I would go out into fields in the spring and see the new generation of tall, buff, young, highly capitalized, college trained farmers pumping ammonia into the ground, as well as lots of other fertilizers and lots of chemicals, chemicals, chemicals all the time, all around us. Later, they'd break out the combines. All the mobile machinery they were using was enormous and expensive. We had thunderstorms on the windswept prairie. Torrential rains were common in the spring, the summer, and the fall. The rains produced brown torrents of water that rushed into ditches alongside rural roads. I know that much of that runoff was going into Lake Springfield. I felt like I had brought my family to a place that was surrounded by a chemical soup. But when I went back to Eugene in the summers in Oregon, I found that they were doing the same thing to the Northwestern forest that we were doing to the prairie in the Midwest. Clear cutting on steep slopes, on steep slopes was rampant. Clear cutting was hollowing out the forest canopy, destroying habitat, turning the runoff brown with silt. There in Illinois, we were teaching ourselves how to conserve resources by recycling and reusing. I bought a six wheeler GMC farm truck. And this turns out to be an important feature in this story, by the way. So students and I could cruise the long straight alleys of Springfield looking for cast off building materials to use. And then I quit my job all in a big rush one December in 1975. My plan was to drive back to Oregon with my 1948 GMC farm truck and a small travel trailer loaded with our worldly goods. I started reintegrating back into the Eugene scene right away. A volunteer opportunity at the Growers Market Food Cooperative put me in direct touch with the biggest dump in Lane County. Since I had a heavy duty farm truck with an eight by 12 bed in Oak Sides, it was easy to become the guy who took all the leftovers to the Day Island landfill after the food distribution was completed. My Midwest grain truck was right sized for the task. I would go to growers, pick up a load and drive out to the Lane County dump with a full truckload of mostly waxed and wooden boxes that the growers market co-op had no way to recycle, plus a lot of food trimmings. I would just throw it all off into the pit at first. It, it was wasteful, but 
the food co-op had no alternative way to handle the material. The social scene there was fascinating. All kinds of vehicles dumping at once, everyone in a hurry. I watched people as they were throwing their loads into the pit. I'm looking down into the pit and doing this little mental exercise. What is that stuff? What's down there? I spotted all kinds of usable lumber, doors and windows, clothing and toys, pots and pans, so much reusable stuff. There were also a great number of items that I identified as recyclable. And at a different landfill, Dan says, I saw many things being dumped that we knew could be sold. I remember vividly one guy who came in with a whole trailer load of reused stuff, nice artwork and furniture. He threw it all into the pit. I walked up to him and said, why are you throwing away all this good stuff? And he said, I'm divorcing my wife and this is hers. I can't stand her anymore, so I'm throwing her stuff away. And I thought, for God's sake, this shouldn't be happening. But the county had signs up that said no salvaging allowed. What to do? After a few visits, I decided I didn't respect that command. I thought the no salvage rule was stupid and unnecessary. I looked for a way to save something that someone could use. I knew the EPA was giving them the same guidance to waste everything. It advised local governments not to allow scavengers. Scavenging would supposedly betray the manufacturer's trust, it said. The sanitary landfill was meant to destroy resources, not conserve them. Besides, EPA said, scavenging was too dangerous. I soon learned that the EPA directive itself was the source of the danger. My county employee made a run at me with a bulldozer to stop me from salvaging. He came within a few feet of killing me. I had backed my truck up to a tall pile of sawdust that had long four by four timbers poking out. No nails, just off cuts, clean, great stuff. I was throwing all this lumber onto the truck feeling good because I knew a bunch of people by then who were woodworkers. I'd have no problem getting rid of this stuff. A county employee was there dressed in white coveralls. He was a few hundred feet away. I kept my eye on him as I was putting these really fine timbers into the truck. He looked at me too. And then he climbed into his bull bulldozer and fired it up. I saw the puff of black diesel smoke and I figured he might be about to push that garbage out of the pit, but no, he came in my direction. But he wasn't coming directly at me, so I threw another timber into the truck. When he got about 60 feet away and looked like he was going to pass by, he locked the track on the right side of the dozer, which causes it to spin and point directly at me. Then he raised the blade and came straight toward the pile I was working on. I had to do something real quick, so I jumped into the cab of my truck and closed the door. He thundered by in a cloud of dust about five feet away hitting the pile I'd been working on and pushed it away. He didn't even look back. And then fate intervened. I became a county employee myself. Well, in Dan's interview, there follows this wonderful story about a refuse derived fuel plant or RDF plant that Dan warned the county was designed, had designed it in such a way that it was gonna blow up. But of course, they didn't wanna hear about that. But Dan and his team did propose an alternative. As he tells it, we did have an alternative plan, and it started with developing reuse and dramatically changing the way the transfer station handled metals. But when I used to face meeting with the head of the mighty solid waste division, before I could even explain our plan to, plan to him, he said, Dan, you've got to understand one thing. There's nothing valuable in solid waste, or it wouldn't be in solid waste. And he wasn't kidding. He really believed this. And of course, as an aside here, everyone really believed in the RDF plant as well, but just as Dan had predicted, it did blow up spectacularly a couple years later. Soon Dan's life circumstances changed and he decided, okay, this is what he's writing. I'm going first to Berkeley. And then if I don't make it in Berkeley in a week, I'm gonna go back up north to Portland. I got a ride to the edge of town. I started hitchhiking. I left with 40 bucks in my pocket and I got all the way down the Oregon coast to Northern California in one day. When I arrived in Berkeley, I rolled out a sleeping bag on a couch in my former roommate, Mark's house. Mark said I should go see Pam Bellchamber who was running a nonprofit called the Community Conservation Center. She said, well, you know, there's an interesting situation out at the Berkeley landfill. This just happened a couple of months ago. A new company is doing salvage out there and they need help. 
You seem to know what you're doing. Why not go see if they would hire you? Four days after arriving in Berkeley, I was a fully permitted scavenger. And not long after that, in 1980, about nine years after he'd first left Oregon for Illinois, intending to spend his life teaching college classes as a sociology professor, Dan filled out his first business tax form at the California Board of Equalization. And this is what he says. I found a blank on the application, company name that had to be filled out. I remembered somewhere running across the words urban ore in a few articles I read about recycling back in Oregon. So I said, well, uh, how about if we call it urban ore? And they said, okay. So urban ore became urban ore because the state required a name in order to give us a sales tax number. So that's kind of a long, strange trip, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I should have asked you before we before you started, what, what's the recycling archives and why should we care? Um, the, re the recycling archives, there's not been a lot of historical memory saved in the recycling industry. Um, there's, there's not a place where all of the wisdom that people have been gathering for all these years has been brought together and, and created as like an archival sort of situation to be able to take advantage of it. And a number of the people that started some of the early programs have, we've been losing them and, and losing just amazing stories and amounts of wisdom that they had. So um, Dan and Neil Seldman were part of a group back in 2007 that said, let's get some of those people together. We'll do interviews. We'll st try to save some of this information. And then that, that happened then, and then there was sort of a lull. And then over the past two or three years, we've started it up again and now have, I think, uh, at least 60 or more interviews and hundreds of people that we want to interview. And, um, and it's really amazing because a, a lot of these are people that I know also and have worked with in my part of the recycling career. And some of them I've been close friends with. And yet when I've interviewed them or read their interviews, there are so many stories in them that even I didn't know, even though we talked a, a lot about their work before. So it seems to be a great way to bring out a lot of the history that also gives us more of, an, of a way to look at um, how can we be setting things up better? What were the original guiding values and, and visions? And uh, they seem to be really important information that we need now trying to get recycling back on track. Thank you. So this will be a, a monthly feature of our SWAC show, along with some hot topic. I think next month's topic is going to be four ways that zero waste can save the planet, although I don't have the speakers put together yet for it. Um, but thank you for, doing, for, the, for the reading, Susan. And I think for our SWAC meeting, we'll move on to the, uh, the legislative advocacy. And there are four bottle bills. And Doug, do you want to talk about those? Doug is our legislative person for the for ZWAC. And you're, you're on mute. I guess I hit it too many times. Okay, so yesterday I sent out a, a compilation of, um, well, we have uh, two different uh, pots of bills. Uh, one is the Clean Seas Lobby Coalition of which Nicker is a member. And um, uh, as a, um, I guess an artifact of being a member of that organization, uh, we've actually uh, uh, undersigned or uh, joined uh, on support letters of uh, 15 bills so far. Um, uh, two of those are uh, uh, four of the recycling bills, uh, 962, which encourages, encourages the use of uh, refillable containers instead of uh, crushing them for recycling. And the other one is AB 1454. And I'm just reading some notes that John sent me earlier, uh, which appoints an advisory board to advise Cal Recycle with the expense reimbursement to the advisory board and changes the rules for defining convenience zones. Now, after listening to with Susan, uh, I, I'm kind of on the, on the mind that perhaps um, it's not gonna really be the, uh, uh, the fix all that we all had hoped and envisioned. So um, that was uh, kind of a, um, a revelation I wasn't aware of. Um, now, all the bills that are currently um, in the hopper as far as uh, before the legislature, 
what I did was post these on the uh, on the website, the uh, the NICR website advocacy. If you go to the uh, 2021 legislation, you'll see all those bills. There's about 40 cow recycle bills uh, that are going to work their way through the uh, different committees and hopefully whittle their way down to a, a manageable size that we can start taking positions on. Um, so now um, let me just read the other uh, bill, which is AB 1311 which encourages the use of reverse vending machines and relaxes certain rules for daily limits of containers brought to redemption centers. Now, this is just, you know, I, what I did was send out the fact sheets for each one of these four bills. So this is just kind of a skimming, just uh, in a very brief synopsis as to what these bills are for now. And Senate Bill 38, <clears throat> as John characterized as just a full on British Columbia style EPR bill. So with that, it's just kind of a starting point of discussion. Does anybody have any uh, any comments? I noticed that uh, Jeff is on board. Um, I'd be curious to see if he has any comments or any any uh, opinions or thoughts on these bills, or anybody else for that matter. Mary Lou. Well, I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of British Columbia EPR, and the function of a producer. Of a, of a stewardship organization is to be a market middleman and a monopoly buyer of all the resources. And in British Columbia, they, as a, as a uh, legal monopoly, they tend to behave the way monopolies do, which is very abusive. And now the operators in British Columbia, 170 of them at this point, have banded together and are looking for some uh, governmental intervention and oversight because in British Columbia, there isn't even an oversight body. And the Ministry of the Environment says, well, we would sure like to do what we're legally obligated to do, but we only have six people in the whole province, which is like twice as big as California. We have six people to oversee all EPR programs and we don't have any budget to hire any more. And there's no funding in the mechanism to help us fund an oversight body. So we cannot help you by overseeing the mandated monopoly that we set up. And the mandated monopoly that they set up is very, very abusive and I could go into long uh, gruesome detail about how many businesses they have closed down and knuckled under. It's very, very uh, negative uh, development. And anybody who can oppose it ought to. You know, so much for your free market business. This was actually, so have, this was in the very early um, stages of EPR when it first came to this, to this country from Sweden one of the things they said was no end of life fees are allowed. That was in their EPR uh, principles and they don't talk about that anymore. But I think that explains a whole lot about their behavior. They wanna be the ones that do all the money and everything and they're <clears throat> really behind them are these huge corporations like Nestle Waters but also lurking in the background is a company called Covanta which is the largest uh, incinerator vendor in the world. And they want to burn plastics. And they're on the board of their national organization. Covanta well, is. They're, they're on the board. <clears throat> Covanta is on the board of the national, the, the US national uh, EPR lobbying organization. They helped start the EPR lobbying organization. And just sort of coincidentally, wherever EPR is uh, firmly established, you will find incinerators, uh, normally mass burn incinerators. So um, the relationship between incineration and EPR is um, not coincidental, but you can't draw straight lines in the legislation either. It just happens that the structure that EPR sets up is extremely beneficial to somebody who wants to run an incinerator and make the claim zero waste to landfill, which is how EPR was invented in uh, Sweden, where they have what, 90? 30, 30 incinerators. 30 incinerators. How much they, and they burn 50% 50 of the resource, discarded resources. So 
Um, and they're very, very pleased, Sweden is very pleased to say they're dramatically uh, accomplished in recycling because they have this wonderful EPR program and uh, they recycle all of their stuff that they throw into the incinerator. So they, they call it burning is recycling in Sweden and um, it's not a totally enlightened approach. So, and certainly not one that NICRA would appreciate. So um, EPR accompanied, EPR is almost always accompanied by incineration. And uh, there are various structural reasons for that, that if somebody wants to have a, a more detailed technical discussion about the structure of the industry in British Columbia, I'd be just delighted to do it, but um, it, it's, it would be sort of tedious for, for this moment, but, but it's, um, EPR is very detrimental to uh, initiative and uh, free management of your own enterprise. You become a captive, you're like a serf. It's terrible. So I have a couple of thoughts I'm gonna share about SB38, but I see that Jeff Donlevy's on the call and he's in the container business. And I'm wondering if you're willing to talk to Jeff is there any current legislation that's going to help from your point of view? No, you don't want to talk. Oh, here we go. Uh, th thank you for having me. Um, the legislation that's that's presented right now, uh, not comfortable with any of it, uh, but they all do open the discussion. Um, it gets the discussion going. Um, Susan had some some great points. Um, with SB 38, the one thing that uh, we do like about it is it basically wipes the slate clean and we can start over. There's a lot of good things that are working in the program um, that could uh, be duplicated, uh, but if it is a program that would create a monopoly, that's not something that would be good for California. Um, the, the brick and mortar per pound system uh, the redemption centers that we've seen in California, to their detriment, they're very efficient and uh, they can be very cost effective. And that has unfortunately driven uh, the subsidies down and it creates, I think Susan calls it the death spiral and the uh, payments to the recycling centers continue to go down as you have fewer recycling centers because they handle more containers that mean that they're more efficient. So uh, if we continue the way that we're on, we'd be left with uh, just a couple recycling centers. So in the Bay Area today, I think there's less than 12 recycling centers for about 4.6 million people. Um, we do need to fix it um, with 38. If it had an organization that could manage the program and independently make decisions outside of the legislature, that would be a good thing. But as uh, the person earlier pointed out, um, creating a monopoly and taking away uh, private business would not be supported by uh, anybody. So um, on the other side, 1454 um, has some items in there that uh, we're pretty uncomfortable with. Um, they talk about fixing the formula. Uh, it doesn't fix the formula. It would just split it in three. And it would have, I think, detrimental effect to all the recycling centers in the Bay Area, uh, probably cut their funding about 50%, which I think would cause several of them to close in the very near term. Um, it talks about paying all the low volume recycling centers. Uh, but the one thing I'll just uh, express to everybody here tonight is it's not the size of the facility that needs help. It's the location of the facility. In California, we have 58 counties. 36 counties have a total of 134 redemption centers. So on average, those 36 counties have three redemption centers. Any additional funding that goes out of the bottle bill should focus on those 36 counties. So we can open more redemption centers in those areas. The bottle bill works in Southern California. In, in a lot of areas, not west of the 405, not Culver City, not Santa Monica. Those are higher cost jurisdictions, but in several counties, it does work pretty well. But there's 36 counties that are highly underserved. 
And that's where the focus needs to be. How do we open uh, more redemption centers in those locations? Um, so uh, the bills that are out there, it opens the discussion. Hopefully in the next few months, there'll be um, some consolidation and we'll figure out the best way to do it. Um, if you were to ask me, I would like to see Director Wagner get a lot of authority to make some de decisions quickly. Uh, so if the legislature were to delegate her authority and decision-making power, um, I think it could make some good changes, but enforcement is key. Uh, there's areas that Cal Recycle has definitely shied away from, and I'm not sure exactly why they've done that. Um, but uh, whether it be Director Wagner or a third party, somebody having the ability to make decisions outside of the legislature would help the California program. So uh, none of the bills are, are highly supported by us. 1311 um, is pretty simple. Uh, the refillables is good, um, but they all open the discussion and hopefully something will happen because um, the underserved counties, it just doesn't look like it's gonna get any better and it'll probably get worse uh, as the subsidies start dropping in the next six to 12 months because commodity prices have, have rebounded a little bit, so. Well, well, let me try to put you on the spot and you can say, I don't wanna answer if you don't, but you're in a for-profit business and you're talking about a service need that needs to be filled. As a for-profit business, given the history of the bottle bill, what needs to be said to you to make you want to invest money to expand your business in an underserved area? That there'll be a stable flow of, of revenue coming in. So I could go to Costco and convince them that if they opened up recycling centers at all their stores tomorrow, they would be the largest recycling company in California starting tomorrow. But because of their set success, they would drive down the, the subsidies provided by the state, not only to them, but to every other recycling center in the state. So the, the more they do, the harder they work, the less subsidies that they would receive by the state because the, the cost of doing uh, business providing recycling services, especially for glass and plastic, it needs the subsidies. But the way that the formula works, the more a recycling center does, if they create innovation that lowers their costs, the state will take away those subsidies. So um, a large company like Costco, they could be the largest recycling company in California. Eventually, their success would generate less revenue for them. So I think the Hawaii program, uh, they identify a cost and then they incrementally increase it each year uh, based on CPI. So it's a predictable uh, future revenue stream that, that somebody could invest in. But the formula today, I, I would not recommend uh, to anybody like a Costco, uh, to get into the business. It's very, very difficult, especially in the higher cost um, areas like the Bay Area. Well, thank you for sharing that because I, you know, I represent businesses as a lawyer and I, and I understand that stable cash flow, predictable cash flow is really a key. And I'm not sure that the regulatory people really understand that. The, the things I wanted to say about SB 38, um, it's long. Yeah. Susan Collins hasn't read this version. She's read a past version. Um, I can't claim that I've read it cover to cover, but I have read it enough to see that it isn't just about the bottle bill or creating an EPR system for the bottle bill. It's got a lot of other stuff. It's got an EPR system for e-waste. It's got an EPR system for waste tires. Put aside whether those are good or not. There, there's multiple things. There's 14 other statutes having nothing to do with the bottle bill that are amended or added. And I promise you as a lawyer that somebody very clever has sat down in that 150 page document and put something in the fine print that they really, really, really want that will really, really, really help them. And they've paid lobbyists to really, really push that part of it. 
So I find bills that have multiple things in them to be suspect right off the bat. There's something bad somewhere in there and they're counting on nobody to find it until it's too late. If Susan can't find it, no one can find it. <laughs> um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing I, I wanna highlight about EPR is one of the guiding principles for EPR, the, what, the thing that's stated in all the EPR websites is that it's gotta have a level playing field. Government's gotta make a level playing field for all stakeholders. That's sort of in their constitution for EPR. Well, we're looking at the bottle bill. And I don't think anybody could, could say with a straight face that there's been a level playing field for all stakeholder, stakeholders in the bottle bill. So while I appreciate the perspective that there's nothing better out there to change the status quo than SB 38, I have to, to, to make the caution that, you know, if SB 38 ad adheres to EPR principles, it's doomed to be no better than what we've got and probably worse given what Mary Lou is saying. So those are my thoughts about SB 38. I, you know, I'm not going to get into the minutia. Susan's right. There's a lot of things you can criticize. There's pros and cons, but it's too much, and it's just it's badly based. I think. So I wonder, you know, given the tenor of the call, and I'll get to you in a second, Dan. Okay. It seems like, from what I'm hearing, the legislature needs to have something that's targeted, and it's got to be specific, and it sounds like it's got to help the redemption centers, especially in underserved areas. So I'm wondering why NICRA doesn't get behind an effort for that. You know, whatever the Clean Seas Coalition wants, if they want to reduce plastic pollution, God bless them. But if we're talking about something to improve the bottle bill, everybody seems to be in agreement that it's the redemption centers that need the help. Maybe that's what we ought to be getting behind. That's what I think. Dan? I would like to um, bring, bring us back to Kavanta for a minute. Um, I have just uh, finished an edit of a real interesting uh, bachelor's degree um, uh, thesis written by a person who's on this call, Natalie uh, Calhoun. And she's sitting there and she's waving her hand. And uh, she was a student at Connecticut College when she did this study, trying to figure out where all the stuff that students throw away goes. And she looked at a whole bunch of different places, and one of them was an incinerator run by Covanta. Now, I uh, asked her last night for permission to read from that, but uh, I didn't get it in time, so I can't read from it now because it's kind of hidden on my desktop. But Natalie's here, and I thought maybe she could tell you what was so arresting to me about that description of Covanta, because in her discussion. Here she is, a college student, uh, and complete innocent to the field of uh, solid waste. And she, here she is going to this big incinerator, 10,000 tons, if I remember right, 10,000 tons per day being burned. Wow, um, that's a lot. On an East Coast incinerator run by Covanta. And she asks the question about, well, what about things like household hazardous waste? What about uh, painted stuff? What about what about paints? What about pharmaceuticals? What you know? And she gets an answer. Would you like to speak to that, um, please, Natalie? Sure. Well, um, I went on this school field trip. I was kind of tagging along with a freshman environmental studies class as a senior to try and get some more background information for my senior thesis on the waste system um, around my school in Connecticut. And at the incinerator, it had very few protections for household hazardous waste from entering the incinerator burn process. While we were there, they were telling us about how there's some materials that burn and create a lot more energy than others. And they try and keep certain materials out such as large tires. And then immediately following that comment, we saw a tire get tipped into the conveyor belt line to go into the incinerator. <laughs> so the whole thing was a little, you know, it was less than confident was the feeling that we had as we left that tour, especially since our school was downwind from that facility. <laughs> I was on a sports team that breathed in a lot of that air. And the incinerator team was really clear that they preferred 
paper goods and a lot of these commonly recyclable materials as a burning feedstock because they burn cleaner and because they can get a lot more energy out of it. So, so they like all those nice recyclables, but they want to burn them? Yes. So that's, well, what, you're getting, that's what you're getting when you get EPR and Covanta is definitely part of the picture. Yeah. And incineration has been part of the picture since EPR was invented in Sweden. Uh, they, as Mary Lou explained it, uh, Sweden's a long, narrow country with a body of water downwind, so nobody's there to really get all these emissions. I think that's one of the reasons most of our incinerators in this country are on the East Coast rather than the West Coast. We stop most of them here because we have a lot of people downwind. Uh, but back East, you know, there's just the ocean. And fish can't really, but, uh, they don't have a lobbying group. No. Well, we do have an incinerator in California. And Tim, I, since you're on the call, I'll, I'll bring this up. Many years ago, NICRA did a a tour. We had to have a carpool there to the Covana incinerator in Merced. And it was one of the best tours that I've ever done with Nick Grant. And it would certainly be right for a for a revisit, I think. If you're if if we're if we're touring anything again, that would be a good place. They could Yeah. Yeah, I remember I remember uh a weird ash falling from the sky when he walked outside after the tour and I thought it was almost a joke, but it was it was actually falling from their creepy tower. It was. Yeah. Oh, what was falling? Ash. Mm. Yeah, it was, I remember it, it was in a cinder block room with no doors or windows protecting it from going outside. And I think we were all too shocked to say anything. That's but actually, if you could arrange, we, have that would be a that we have one of our interviews that actually says that it's John Hall's. Um, interview and he was on that tour I think because I remember the discussion he said that it was a cinder block uh, building where the ash went and that wind could just pick it all up and blow it right out into the forest that's nearby well that's disposal of a kind yeah. yes. <laughs> dilution is a solution to pollution as they used to right. say a long time ago the solution so, to pollution is dilution <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Doug, Doug, is there any other legislative activity you want to talk about? Well, nothing uh, beyond uh, what we just talked about. And I'm really kind of uh, perplexed. I mean, here we are in April, and this legislative session is uh, well underway. And I'm understanding that, um, uh, I guess, the two premier bills that, uh, well, Senate Bill 38 is that's one that seems like I get, I get the gist that people are not interested in that because it's just going to be a uh, create more problems than it's worth. But then, so you look at uh, 1454, and that's got uh, that doesn't really go to the extent that uh, beyond just simply um, doing what it does. So, isn't there a, a some you know, there's been bottle bills that have come and gone over the years, and um, you know, we've lost 1300 recycling centers over the years. It seems to me there's got to be a uh, um, an amalgam of a, a, a master blueprint or something that does all the things, has all the features and, that we need to make a, uh, to redeem the bottle, bottle bill system in California. And it, you know, what am I missing? You know, why isn't that happening? Uh, is it too late in this legislative session, session to get the discussions focused on getting uh, piecing together a, a workable bottle bill that's gonna solve all the problems? Um, you know, Jeff talked about, uh, you know, uh -huh. These bills are, you know, be kind of a, the, the catalyst for the discussions, but, you know, what discussions, by whom? Well, we now have a social media component of NICRA, and maybe that's that's a good good thing for us to be thinking about using it for. I mean, the, it seems pretty clear that it's the redemption centers we ought to be talking about helping, and there's it's pretty clear that there's no current bill that's really going to do that. So maybe that's where this committee ought to be trying to focus its attention. And yes, it's late in the legislative season, but we saw Fiona Ma, you know, getting them into bill to, to, you know, expand the Portrayal Hills landfill a number of years ago. So maybe we ought to find some legislator that is willing to take an existing bill and turn it into a pro redemption center. And if Susan's right that everybody else will, will be against it, well, we'll just have to deal with that. I don't know why they would be against it, but they are. Maybe that's what we ought to do if there's any 
interest in doing that for anybody else. Mary Lou? I think that's a very good idea because in point of fact, in the California legislature, it is routine at the very last minute in the, in the legislative session to gut a bill and just uh, jack up the hood ornament and drive in a new vehicle underneath. So <laughs> if you have something, it's true. And if you have something that's ready to go, you can do that. And if you, but you need a, a, an ally, you need somebody in the legislature who will introduce that bill and carry it. And then you need people who will go there and um, help lobby for it. But you can do that. You can, you could, you could, they can jack something up and drive in a new bill in like July, August. So the question then would be who would write that bill? And I would like to suggest that everybody take a look at that little piece that I put into my piece on the sociological imagination. It was from uh, an interview by uh, on uh, or, or done by Susan Kinsella with um, um, Delyn Keyes. Now Delyn Keyes was mostly involved when she was doing recycling legislation in Oregon, but she now lives in California. She lives in up and around Novato and she's, I think, somewhat available. She's probably one of the most brilliant uh, legislative uh, people that I know of right now. And I would really suggest that somebody talk to her about possibly getting involved in writing this bill, if you want to do a bill, a substitute bill that yeah. could be gut and amended uh, by somebody that we might be able to convince to do that. She could work with very closely with Susan Collins. I think Delyn would just love meeting Susan. And uh, she's just absolutely a brilliant, brilliant person when it comes to um, turning things into. She did, she did the Oregon Recycling Act, which was first, public, first um, passed unanimously by the state legislature in 1983 and then subsequently in, uh, substantially amended again in 1990 and spread recycling all over the state of Oregon. So she's had very, very big uh, legislative experience and she lives right over in uh, west of us. David, did you have a question or something you wanted to add? I just wanted to say, yes, finally, this is great. No, we should, we should have done this three years ago. Um, I think, <laughs> no, this is, this is the right thing. We, we keep waiting for someone else to write the right bill and it never happens. So let's just write our own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've, We've got the people in this room to do it, you know, plus to Lynn. Um, I, I do want to point out how complicated it is, even in this group here. We all, I think, have very similar goals, but there's some people that find, you know, 38 unacceptable and others that find 1454 unacceptable. And, you know, so even in this group, we can't agree often. And I think the secret is to keep it simple and targeted. Um, you know, maybe I'm, you guys can tell me if I'm missing something, you guys that really study it more, but. I've heard Susan say many times that there's just a simple fix of fixing the formula, you know, and maybe even as, as Jeff said, also empowering Cow Recycle to tweak the formula later without having to go through this process again yes. in the legislature. Um, but, you know, something really simple that just fixes the formula to give the centers that need it more money, just really simple. And I think there'd be very few opponents. If we try to do something grandiose like, EPR or even something that would be great, like adding wine bottles or, you know, various other things that are bigger and more ambitious, there are going to be a million people to shoot it down. But if we just simply say, allow Cal Recycle to spend that huge surplus of money to bring back the buyback centers, I can't imagine there'd be too many people opposed to it. So those are my well, thoughts. I agree. That, that's certainly true. And <laughs> when you're trying lawsuits, you have to keep it simple. Arthur, did you want to add something? You have to unmute yourself. Unmute, Arthur. It's in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. No, still not unmuted. Um, until he figures that out, it seems to me the simplest thing to do would be to raise the nickel to a dime. Oh, OK. You're on. My life? Oh. You're on. My life. A long time ago, somebody said to me that uh, the federal government has all the money, the states have all the power, and local governments have all the problems. 
And it seems to me that if we could get the boards of supervisors of the various states, of the various counties, to take a control of the 400 million that's done, that we could probably solve the problem of not having uh, enough CRV sites. That's a thought. I'm not sure it will work, but it's certainly something that I don't think has been brought up yet. Uh, and that would really put the, the local government people in a very different position than they are now, which seems to me is they're very collaborative with, uh, they don't care really about uh, whether there's CRV uh, opportunities or not. Over. Well, here, here's what I'm thinking. Um, when, Richard, when Richard Valle was on earlier, he was obviously very upset at the treatment of redemption centers, upset enough to using his position as a county supervisor to engage the county district attorney, Nancy O'Malley, who I happen to know has been active in, you know, uh, containing abuses of uh, different recycling aspects. I think that I ought to engage with Richard and, and Nancy O'Malley and see what they're up to and use that as a tool to start a, an effort to craft a very focused you know, narrow thing that would get more benefit to the recycling centers and figure out a legislative strategy using social media to move that forward. That's what I think that we probably ought to do and I'm open to disagreement. Good luck. Go for it. Good luck, John. I was just saying earlier, is anyone opposed to raising the value from a nickel to a dime? Would that be a good place to start? Well, I don't think that helps the redemption centers. I think that we got to help them. Uh, Jeff, you... 400 million and uh, <clears throat> what? In Alameda County, there are eight places to get your nickels back for 1.6 million people. That's a that's a that's a that's a crime. It's a shame. It's public stealing. And uh, you know, until you deal with that problem, I think I wouldn't give them. I wouldn't give them. I wouldn't take another nickel out of the public. I think it's a bad idea. Period. Jeff, did you want to add something? Yes, you, you got to fix the number of redemption locations first, and then increasing the deposit from a nickel to a dime, I think, has merit for the items that aren't recycled a whole lot glass bottles, number two plastic, three through seven, increase those deposits. So hopefully the beverage manufacturers will look at converting their products into either aluminum or uh, number one plastic. Because if you increase the deposit from a nickel to a dime for everything, um, there's a cost associated with that. It doubles the float for the recycling centers but you would have to fix the structural issue with the program because going from a nickel to a dime could be an enormous windfall for the waste haulers for doing no additional work. <laughs> yeah, that suits them. So, <laughs> yeah, at the that expense of Thank the you. people who are paying in a dime and have no way to get that dime back, it, yeah, for them it, it, it adds insult to injury. Got it, that makes sense. Thank you. So, so one of the one of the reasons we we set up this new format for the for the monthly ZWAC meetings was to try to share ideas and engage people, and that's really what we want to do. And it sounds like there's a there's a some commonality in the themes that we're talking about, some maybe some variance in ideas in how to do that, but that's what we need to do offline, you know, during this next thirty days or so before our next meeting. So I suggest, Doug, maybe you could send. Uh, put in the chat room your your and my email addresses and encourage people to bring their ideas to us and we'll we'll just have a you know a, a an email dialogue during the next 30 days about it because i i think these are you know i'd like to see these ideas come to fruition obviously we can't do it on a on a zoom call but i think that we're trying to game in a in a particular direction and so i propose that we put this on not on hold for, for the next 30 days, but engage with each other and anybody else you think ought to be involved in it for the next 30 days. And we check in at, at, the, at the May meeting and see where we go from there. That's what I think. 
Good. It's, you know, we're, we're not doing anything right now that's helping, so let's do something. Right, Bonnie? Let's do something. Is there anybody else we, that wants to bring up anything that we haven't talked about? Uh, Liz, did you yeah, want to? I got something. Well, Liz no, has I, a, um, I didn't have I anything. I noticed that Nick does not have something. Okay, Arthur, do you want well, to have, let you let want to talk about first. something? 